good. All right, let me call the meeting to order. And let's uh, do a pledge if we can. So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Let me do a, a roll call. I see Molly, Justice, George, Wren, Dan. Lee is here. Uh, Paloma is excused. I see the city administrator. I assume uh, we have an attorney on the call somewhere. Christian will be joining us a few minutes late, uh, but he'll be in at any moment. All right. In so person. Christian's coming in person? Yes. Okay. Correct. Um, okay. So welcome, everyone. Um, the first thing we've got is a community segment. Uh, and we have a um, police advisory committee. That was a committee that uh, I was an ad hoc one that I appointed and asked to look at the follow-up issues associated with uh, police oversight and various policies that the council had asked them to take a look at. And I'm just going to uh, turn it over to the group. I think it's Pastor Perez and Terry Nelson. Are you going to talk to us? And we've got Lieutenant Figlia here as well. So thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and certainly to our esteemed mayor and to all uh, of our council. We thank you for this opportunity to come and share this report. Uh, we were put together with myself, and it was originally uh, myself and Mark Unger, who were the co-chairs, and then Mark uh, threw to, got busy with his uh, other duties and uh, I think interimly uh, this gentleman standing behind me, I think some of you might know. Uh, I think his name is Terry. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think he and I now are uh, continuing the efforts of this police advisor. So really where it came from is that I worked on the E203 for Dutchess County and then also worked on the E203 for the city of Beacon. And what we did was we put together a lot of the things that came from the report through Dutchess County and then took what was really applicable to the city and of those things, uh, I believe that everyone has a copy of the mm -hmm. full report. I am not going to go through the entire report and um, put everyone to sleep because um, you guys have a lot of work to do. So what I wanted to do is just really cover a couple of the uh, highlights that we looked at from this report. Um, and the, our original committee where we had, I believe the mayor had appointed eight of us. And we were meeting on a bi-monthly basis. And I think um, if with everyone's approval, uh, we'd probably look to change that to more of a quarterly basis. And uh, really just continue to be a part of this committee and to see how things progress as we see in this report has truly uh, been remarkable of the things that have been accomplished. Uh, and if I can just hit a couple things. So when we look at uh, community engagement you know one of the things that was was covered in our meetings we had presentations made with regard to the Beacon Youth Com uh, Police Academy and how that was restarted and I think that when we saw that you have the opportunity to touch you know 20 lives uh, through in, in our high school and at least either that they, they want a a to look at how to become an officer maybe down the road or just learn more about it. It gave them an opportunity to do so and that was one of the things we saw and it was highlighted and we talked about in our Dutchess County report how we needed to be and interact in our community and it was something that was certainly highlighted as we put together in the uh, city report. The other thing that I wanted to, to point out um, and how critical this was is that for our committee when the uh, cameras were used in 2022 um, it was critically important, uh, as the report stipulates, um, how that use of force incident occurred in 22. With those cameras being deployed, we were able to see as a committee, once the incident happened, all the different angles and how we were able to understand the exact, the timing and the procedure in which the officers took and how everyone uh, responded. And it was, a, it was one of the things we certainly pointed out and how additionally now three cameras have been added. And the other thing that we looked at from a camera perspective is that this city started the cameras in 2018. And it was one of the things that I, we worked on, in the, uh, I'm on the Dutchess County Criminal Justice Council, and one of the things that were highlighted is everybody was trying to get 
the cameras deployed throughout the county. Well, a lot of our, a lot of our fellow municipalities are now starting to get cameras. We've had cameras for four years. And I think with that, we have been one uh, city that we can say is ahead of the, the curve on that. The other thing is that was the training. And it was an incident again in 2022 when an officer, due to his you know, scenario-based training, was able to apprehend the individual that, that was reported on a domestic violence issue. Because of his training, because of the way he reacted, there was an incident that really was resolved without using his weapon. And that, because of the training that he had, was something that we certainly looked at was a positive. Um, the other aspect was is that we had a chance during our committee meetings to meet with uh, Lashavius and talk about the mental health uh, progression in this, in, in this city. And we certainly thought that that was a highlight. Again, it was pointed out in our report from E203 and to have that come to fruition and, and continue to be used is one of the, a, a big highlight. And the last one, if I can find it, you know, one of the things I think we, we are certainly looking to, to increase and see, and, and see better is certainly from the community policing. And it was something that I know when I talked to Chief Sands and he was saying that he, you know, when he first became chief, he wanted to make sure that he had officers certainly walking the streets, be, being visible, and certainly we continue to encourage that. Um, but we, you know, we see that there is some activity that's happening and, you know, with the Elks Club, there were some cookouts that he did. Um, I think those are the areas we're seeing improvement in, and I think that while this advisory committee will stay, God willing, stay in place, we look to see how we can increase the community um, activities with our officers and with our community, both from a from a faith-based perspective, from a nonprofit perspective, and how we can all work together and bring a more effective change into this city. Um, and the other last, the last thing was because. Uh, we worked on it from a county perspective, was how we've, we've seen the increase in diversity. With the last testing that was done, I believe the numbers that we received from the county level that it was over 1,300 people that took the test. Fees were waived. Uh, training was done. Of the 1,300, I think it whittled down to like 1,100 um, was the number. And to see that it was probably the most diverse ever, and probably in a long time, a diverse amount of people that took that test, both in the African American and Latino community. And to see that we have now looked to have a more diverse uh, police force, and to see that we're starting to look more like our community, um, that is a step in the right direction. And certainly to see that happening, and to see how it was, a lot of people worked really hard to see that diversity happen in that civil service exam. There's still a lot of work to be done there, but as a city, I think that we've made improvements in that. And like I said, I didn't want to hit the whole report. I think that uh, when you have some time, if you haven't read it already, I would certainly encourage you to read the entire report. But uh, I think those are some of the highlights that we, we looked at and certainly want to build on and uh, continue our efforts in this police advisory committee. And I want to thank you all for your time. And Mayor, I turn it back into your hands. Um, Terry or uh, Lieutenant Fickley, you want to add anything? <laughs> Ditto. Please. Um, just uh, I want to just thank you all for your support. Um, I think going forward, Having this be quarterly is a, is a really good thing. Uh, I think that, um, well, you can read the report for yourself. I think we've made great strides in the last four years. And by no means is the work done. This is an ongoing thing. And I think reform and change is ongoing. It's not finite. So um, we are here for the long haul. Thank you. I'll just add, if you haven't looked at the report, the incident that uh, the pastor was referring to was an incident in which a uh, gentleman pulled a loaded high firearm on one of our officers, um, and it was resolved without incident. Um, and then also just to say that as a department, we're looking forward to continuing to do this work and continuing to work with the committee to continue get you know, um, community input into our operations and, and how we go about our business. All right, so before we open it up to any questions on the council, I just would make one remark. I, I read the intro section, and it reminded me that, you know, a lot of the work actually started quite some time ago. So the Department of Justice um, 
uh, got involved in 2004 when they opened an investigation on the city and the council and the mayor spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to professionalize the department and having justice come in was a very helpful opportunity. Uh, they reviewed a number of things, in particular all the policies, um, use of force, uh, the ammunition that was used, um, pursuit policies, and then following that, um, I think they came off of oversight in 2016, I think is the right year, somewhere in there. And then also the department on its own or as encouragement from justice uh, also sought state accreditation and was one of the first communities in the county to achieve accreditation uh, as a police department and then re-upped that again. So I think I kind of, as I read this, kind of discovered that a lot of the basic block and tackling had sort of been undertaken and had a pretty good base to work with. I appreciate the areas that you focused on and I would just open it up to questions or comments from the council. Um, on page seven of the report, um, 10 in the agenda packet, um, uh, under critical policing policies, um, it mentions recent tragedies um, and could you just uh, clarify what those recent tragedies were that it's referring to? I mean, when it comes to warrants, right, I think everybody's aware of the uh, Breonna Taylor incident. I would say that's, that's a significant one in, you know, in affecting how police, department wants to, police departments want to go about executing warrants and what we are looking to prevent. Thank you for that clarification. Um, on page, I believe it's 12 of the report, um, when it's talking about statistics and comparative data, um, one of the things that's mentioned is that our violent crime rate is less than half of Poughkeepsie's, and I was wondering if this is proportionally accounting for the difference in population sizes, or is this uh, specifically numbers-wise? Because... That's the rate. So, yeah, that accounts for um, the difference in the size of the population as well. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, oh, and in that section as well, there was a suggestion uh, in the report for an increased, um, more increased statistics uh, being captured uh, on the department's end. Uh, would you suggest uh, enhancing our capacity for data collection through um, a national accreditation program as opposed to the New York State accreditation program, whereas certain national accreditation programs such as CLIA require more data collection than the New York State accreditation would? I mean, only speaking as staff, I think, right, we would leave that to the community to kind of, if that's something you guys wanted to see us pursue, you know, we, we would be interested in pursuing whatever it is that. Um, as does community. the committee have any specific uh, suggestions then on more data collection um, from the police department? I mean, Councilman Cray, I'm, I'm always one about data. So I, I think that if, if data is, is, it could be captured with, without it putting a significant uh, infringement on your budget, you know, because that's this, this stuff costs money. So I, I think, it, look, the more data points you can get, the the better we are. I think that it certainly helps us in in that point. I mean, I'm just from a I'm a data nerd, so I mean, I, so I can only speak from my own, you know. But yes, if we had the data, that certainly you can do it. Uh, I think it's also you have to look at the cost perspective as well, because we we can't. All we can do is make recommendation, but it's a pound, this board to make the policy changes and or a budget uh, recommendations. May I just ask a, oh, sorry. Oh, just a follow-up question on the data? Um, so in 2020, um, I think it was September 2020, we looked at a data set. It might have been you, Lieutenant Filia, maybe that took us through it. It was a, a breakdown of all of the different calls that were received and how they were tagged. And it might have been following state codes, and I think one of the outcomes of that conversation was that um, that there would be better reporting about uh, the number of calls and the nature of the calls. And I was just wondering if any progress was made towards that in the last couple of years. Yes, you know, one of the main issues with that report was that we were um, <coughs> using a blotter system that was primarily geared towards collecting information internally 
um, and what we've done since, because there was a lot of confusion about what some of the things meant. You know, some of them were using police jargon, like we were calling something uh, according to, it's a little bit insider, but right there used to be a program called NiceBin, and when you put in a stolen vehicle, you called it a file one. That was the file that went through NiceBin. And it created a lot of confusion. People saw that and said, file one, that must be some kind of paperwork thing, right, rather than a stolen car. Um, what we've done since is we've eliminated a number of the, if you, know, if you remember that report, it was, it was almost silly, right, the, the number of, of things we were looking at. So we've narrowed that down to where it's a little bit more transparent as to what each one of those blotters is. Mm -hmm. And is it, um, does it also track the time and date of the calls, or is it just kind of a summary report? We still have that capability. Yeah. It's, it's, you okay. know, we have the same system, so we okay. still have that capability, but again, it, it would be a little bit more user-friendly to yeah. the public if they wanted well, that. Cool. It, 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 um, I mean, appreciate all the work that you guys have done on this, by the way. I should have started with that. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate your commitment to data, because knowing the truth is really the b best way to form policy. Um, so I'm wondering if there could be a, um, some kind of way to share that information with the council on a periodic basis, even an annual basis. Or just like, what is the nature of the calls that we get, and yeah. when do they happen? Um, I obviously don't want to create a ton of work, but if, the, as you said, the information's out there, um, perhaps that's something that we could just all review, even if it's an executive session or something, just so that we are all kind of have a shared understanding of what kind of calls you guys are getting. And yeah, that could certainly be done. And, um, you know, I think the, the chief and Chris would have to then work out exactly what the council wants. Yeah, to, to piggyback on that data request, I, did, I didn't even know that the blotter was on the website, full confession, so I, I went and found it, and so it was great to have that information. I assume, I still didn't understand all the categories, but they weren't police jargon, uh, so I kind of just need probably a little more primer in that, and I wonder if we can make that available to the public as well. And then I also wonder, as Dan was saying, just about what's our overall position. For example, how much are violent crimes versus traffic or, park, uh, traffic or parking violations versus other types of crimes like burglaries and thefts. And so having that understanding is what's actually going on in Beacon will then help us as one form of oversight help you as the committee is another form yeah. of oversight kind of figure out, well, what is the future of, of policing in Beacon? What is sure. the reality right now? So one thing that we do do, and, and we've been doing this for ages, and, and we're required to, is we report to the state. Um, it's called the National Incident-Based Reporting System. Um, and so every month we send statistics up to the state. Um, and then they compile at the end of the year, but, you know, it's the state, so not really the end of the year, like the middle of next year, right? We're, we're looking at probably 2022 becoming available shortly. 2022 wasn't out the last time I checked. Um, and so that we have the um, IBR statistics. And they're actually available um, through DCJS's website. Um, if you guys want a more specific breakdown, you know, we can always work with you guys to do that. If, again, if you guys want to kind of get an idea of, of what type of statistics, what specifically you want to know, and then filter those through through Chris, and we can go from there. And, and we've done that recently. Uh, Justice asked for an analysis of the primary reason for a traffic stop, like why were they why were they pulled over? And um, Sands, uh, the chief, and I decided that that would be tracked through May, so that we have that data back and can take a look at that. Um, I'm hoping that's happening because I know Sands has was out. Um, and if it's not, we'll do it for June. But um, uh, we, we can line up things like that. Great. I'm curious what you see your role versus the role of the council. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that the committee will continue. Um, and I'm wondering what, what you see as some of your, I see there's also a list in the packet of some of the things you've accomplished, some of the things that are in process. The packet also talks a little bit about some things you're not currently pursuing, um, and I'm just curious what, what you see ongoing in the next couple years, kind of how it should work from here. I uh, mean how the committee works? Or? Yes, both how the committee works and how you see the council playing a role as well, as we are also specifically named as one of the ways that has oversight over the, over the police. Well, I mean, I think that we would definitely welcome your feedback. If there is something that we're missing or you know, Lieutenant Figley is missing, you, you inform us and you uh, give us guidance on where to go forward. If, there, if there's something you need to know, we can work on that and look at it and figure it out. Um, we're hoping to work with you, not like 
in these individual silos where we're not talking to each other. So um, hopefully, I mean, when we meet quarterly, I don't know if you're up for this, but you know, maybe we should come, I don't know, quarterly maybe also to give an update or maybe biannually. We're still trying to figure this out. <laughs> so yeah, one no of the problem. things I, I asked uh, them to consider is how the process would work going forward. So I think you're asking kind of a similar question. And so I said, it can, can, can be simple, can it just be a page? But it's like, okay, if you think there's an ongoing role, try to define how it works. You're asking, how is it in connection with what the council might do? Um, maybe you would dig deeper in certain areas. Um, you know, not sure. That, that, I think, is a piece that we should try to define a little more clearly. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I think, Molly, to answer your question, I think the first, the first, as we came together, Mark and I, I think it was just really trying to understand what we, what pieces of this 203 and, and what we were going to work on, because it was a monster, and I think it was trying to, you know, trying to eat an elephant, and there was no way you're going to do it. I think what we tried to do was really focus on the one, a couple things that we could, we, we could impact. You know, when we, we brought the, uh, the Youth Academy, we, we knew that we could, hey, could we, let's get that going. Let's make sure that that's really, let's take it from where it was and let's, let's move it forward. Uh, so those are, those are some of the things. But I think going forward, I, I, I'd really like to see this, this advisory committee invite the community in and let us know what, what are they seeing? What are they hearing in their, near, their neighborhoods? You know, if, if we're a safe place to land, come and talk to us. Right, and I think I invite you to be at these meetings and to hear directly. Maybe you're not hearing from everybody that we're hearing from. Maybe there's a disconnect, and I think sometimes to connect those pieces is how we get better as a community. Um, so I, I think that there is a vital role for this this advisory um, committee, and it can function as, as a certainly uh, collectively as as another as a body, but also I think that we represent the community in different aspects. Certainly from a faith-based side, from other forums and uh, of this community and of this community um, so we're just looking to see we're, we just want to make this better and I think that we we had our first you know we had our first run at it um, and I think now um, that he's here uh, we'll just have, you know we'll just we'll, we'll make it better uh, so there are opportunities but we we invite input from you as well we don't want like I said I don't want we don't want to operate in a silo uh, and, and we want to be able to bring recommendations that we're hearing from the, you know, if there's a community event that we feel that, you know, that, that's, that Chief Frost should be at, I think that we should be able to make those two or three, hey, this is your calendar for the year. These are the five things that are happening. Which one do you want to really be at? And, and really focus on those things to make it, to make it what it is, not just, showing, not, not just a show and tell and showing up. No, really be there. Have, have those conversations while you're there in the community with, with, with the members and and listen to what's happening and sometimes that's all we have to be is better listeners um and so we can get a better idea of what's going on i'll say he does more than five events a year <laughs> well wh yeah whatever they are but you know what i'm saying thank you so so you would say that that would be part of your agenda going forward is to organize these public forums uh, periodically on a regular basis where you would be open to ideas i i i, I think we we should mm -hmm. I, I think it should be a part of it i think you know uh now, Pastor Rembert, uh, certainly we tried to do those early on in the 203. We did one or two. Um, you know, I think, Justice, you were the only person that showed up consistently. But, um, but I think we need more voices. And it shouldn't just be a voice. It should be all the voices of this community to come and talk about what they see and what they feel and be able to then represent that and bring it back to Chief Frost, bring it to our city administrator and our mayor, so that we can be a better community. As, as much as I dislike it, um, social media tends to, people tend to show up there pretty often. If and you do something wrong, it shows up faster. Yeah, <laughs> but it might be interesting to combine both of, you know, a gathering in an auditorium and have a page where people can, you know, sit there at the typewriter and say, I mean, most of it's probably gonna be useless, but there will be gems in there that I think might be worth considering. Or send an email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'll defer to these the this body on that one. But um, I think look, the more the more voices that we can bring around the table, the better off we are. And I think continuing to hear from the same voices sometimes people just turn them off. 
but I think bringing new voices to the table to hear what's going on in policing and getting their feedback is, is I think, the ideal th situation that we need to do and invite people that haven't been heard to be heard so that their voices can be applied to some of these situations because, again, they're seeing things that we're not and they're hearing things that we're not. And giving them a place to come and talk about it is what we need. That's, that's where I feel that we could be a, of, a, of a great assistance. I agree. Um, I also, my, my two cents on this is that the, when the committee first formed, it kind of did two main things. It, one, it kind of it dealt with any low-hanging fruit, like you were mentioning, like the youth academy, not Correct. to suggest that it was you know, easy peasy to do it, or were there any major gr grievous things that were going on in the police department that now was the moment to really put resources towards that. And my understanding from the report is that we didn't find anything grievous and we did the thing. So now is what's next. And one of the things I'm thinking about what, what's next, which ties into the bringing the community in, is what's our vision for what we want the police department to be? And that's actually one of the main things I was missing in the report that I don't, I don't know if there exists a vision statement that the Beacon Police Department has, is that if that's what we want, but I feel like I'm not sure what our state is we want to get to, and then we can judge, are we there yet, or do we want to, other things we want to do? Because that will also address the resources question that came up. Well, yeah, we can gather more data, but it involves resources. But if we're like, well, that's what we need to get to this vision that we all have for our community policing, then that's what we have to put resources towards. So I feel like there might be a step that we get the advisory committee could help come up with, where do we want our policing to be? Where are we now compared to that? And where are our gaps? And I think some of that's in there. I was just missing that unifying vision a bit. That's the educator in you coming out. Um, she's good, I'm sorry. But, uh, but I think Molly, what, I, I think one thing that I would like to add to that is I think it's who makes the we. Right? Who makes up the we? And I think if, if we collectively, yes, are adding those voices that haven't been heard and bringing those to the table and we give them a place that they can talk to, I think that's great. And seeing how they want to shape this going forward. Um, but I'd like to hear from different people, me personally. Um, I, I'd like to you know, see, hear from those that haven't been heard and give them a place that they can talk about their police department and see what, hey, this is great. And then be honest, this sucks. It's broken and I don't like it. And then bring those, those recommendations, those suggestions, those negatives and those positives back and saying, okay, I heard we had, out of 20 people that showed up, 15 people said this was broken. So how do we but, fix it? But it, I, I think also like the chief isn't here today because he's on, on a leave for personal reasons today. But again, part of the, Part of the challenge here is educating people on how the police department works. Having somebody come in who doesn't have any idea of it, we take complaints all the time. Understand there's multiple routes from which complaints can come. You can put a complaint form in through the police department. You can put, you, you all have sent me complaints. I get them about traffic enforcement and noise and other things. The, what was good about this committee is that the police department took time to work with them to educate them. Because you have to actually understand what these processes are before you start to dig in and say, well, we should do X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and so I just want to be you know, clear that there was a lot of time spent going through all of the procedures with this committee, going through where we came with Department of Justice. Um, you know, again, so we do want to hear all voices, but the, the committee took a lot of time to learn how this all works. Yeah, it, it's also true, at least on paper, that we are the people, like we are voted in by representatives, whether or not everyone who we represent agrees with us, they can do that, but also I, I see our collective voices amongst us, and I hope that we also as a council get an opportunity to talk about where we stand and what we've heard, because we also, you know, as Chris just said, we hear things as well and are told things, so I think we could be another input that maybe you haven't had up until this point. Not to say that we're the only one, just between the committee and the council, that's it, but I... But I hope that we do more of that it, as well. It, it could be, Molly, we go to the different wards too, right? It could be that. Maybe we do, whatever, I think, look, whatever can get people in, out, of their comfort, out of their comfort zones and bring them to an, and have a conversation, I think that's what we're open to. And I think to Chris's point that, for example, with that incident that happened on Main Street, if they didn't come in and explain to us everything that happened, they explained it to us, you know, from a tactical standpoint, from a procedural standpoint. So it, 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 it certainly opened our eyes and understanding as a committee as to how that all went down. And he's, he's talking about the same incident that we gave 
give you that same briefing about. Right. So for just Joan Navis, you know, I think that we, we, we certainly had uh, an understand, better understanding and some clarity as to what happened because looking at it from the way I looked at it from the first time, I was like, what in the world's going on? But here's what I did. I'll be honest. I started calling my friends who were in law enforcement. I said, I explained to them, kind of, and said, no, they did everything by the book. Everything was right. And, I, and, I, and having, hear it from them, but hear it from people I also trust and figure out what was really going on, um, not that I don't trust you, but I wanted to also hear from every, somebody else because not, not only do I represent this community, but I also represent a church. And I'm also a lead, as, as a pastor. And if people ask me a question, I wanted to make, they know I do my homework. And I wanted to make sure that I did my due diligence as well. Other questions or comments? And again, we can you know, read through it. If there's more questions, we can always have them come back. Because we are going to have to define a process going forward. So anything else? Yeah, I have a, a, a couple questions. So, um, the uh, if I'm if I'm understanding the relationship between the two reports, um, the police reform and modernization collaborative plan, mm -hmm. there are items in that list that have not been completed, and the recommendation is that they still be done. Or what, what's the what's the recommendations for going forward? Because it seemed like it was like we've implemented a bunch of things and they're and they're quite good and they've made a difference. Um, but I was looking through the, 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 the plan from March 2021 and saw a few things that had never been done that were recommended. So are you recommending that we go through, would you recommend that we go through that and find the things that we haven't done and move forward with them? For example, additional social worker support, a chaplain, there's other things. Yeah, well, the, the chaplain one's near and dear to my heart, but I mean, let's let's. I mean, I can I can we can pin that one for now. But I think there were a couple of things. But look, when, when you're talking about, we could make the recommendations, but it's at the end of the day, it's also what it costs you to do it as well, right? Yeah, so not, there's th a, th this is not just a cost issue. I'm right. I'm going to bring. We have never said no to data because of cost. So, so let's stop talking about cost. We've never okay. been asked about the cost. We've been, never been asked to have a chaplain. Um, yes, we were. We were going no, so me, far me, off. Chris, let me. Let me. I'm, I'm not going to continue to be told that we we don't have the resources. We've never been asked to do this. Your committee never asked the city administration to do anything. When we were asked for data, we are collecting that data. So, Mayor, can we get this back on track, please? Yeah, well, Mayor, before I leave then, so let me make a statement for the, for the, for the record. For the record, the chaplaincy program was asked for on more than one occasion. Now, you want to say I'm a liar? Go right ahead. You Mayor, can try. So Mayor, but no, no, I don't. Was, I'm going to finish my statement. I'm going to finish my statement, Mr. White. Hmm. All right, so let's figure out how to move forward on this. What my suggestion would be to um, Council Member A. Mark Blair's question is that if there's areas that we haven't picked up, um, we should record them and we should just take a look as to whether you want to pick them up or you think you know that they're not necessary or they've been covered in a different way. And that might be one of your next steps, if I can suggest that one. Yep. Would that be all right? Yes. Okay. And, um, and Terry, um, you mentioned that uh, there's other additional reforms that have been discussed. Is there? Well, I'm just saying, as a whole, this is, you know, this document here is not just a checklist. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing thing. We yeah. can add things to Got it. it. Okay. Think of it like the comprehensive plan. Yeah, I just I didn't know if you were had like something else no, that you no, were no, working no. on. And, okay. I, I was speaking in generality. Sorry about that. Nice to have you back in this room, by the way. There's an empty seat up here. <laughs> yeah, no, no, thank you. <laughs> I did have the same question as I was looking at the two um, charts, just um, you know, trying to understand which of these were um, ones that we had decided to put to the, the committee had made it, decided to put to bed, or that the committee had decided. Um, that they wanted to continue to pursue. And I, what I hear you saying is that there maybe are some of both in here. Mm -hmm. yeah, like I said, it's ongoing. We're not married to this, mm -hmm. but you know, we can, like I said, we can make additions. We can subtract some things that we can't do. It's, it's an ongoing thing, and it's an ongoing dialogue between us and you. 
And so. I, I did try to kind of cross check the chart with some of the substance in the report, like civilian oversight, for instance, shows up in the chart is not done, but then there's also a really good explanation um, how the committee kind of decided, I think, that at this time civilian oversight was sufficient, and you named the various entities our council included as a part of that, you know, what the, count, what the committee decided was, was adequate. Right. Right. And, and if we're proven wrong, we will fix it. But that doors are, all those doors are still open right. is what I hear you saying. Thank you. And I also want to say I appreciate your one voice on wanting to continue the committee. Um, and I also really appreciate your interest in involving um, the community more and being open to community discussions within the wards or with the council, as, as uh, Member Rhodes suggests. I think um, I hear that loud and clear, and I agree with you. OK. Sure. Final remarks? Um, could Teresa yell at me just for old time's sake? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Kudos. Thank you so much. You got, a, you got an attaboy. That's not right. right. <laughs> so um, let me just suggest if there's you know further questions, comments, let's forward them to the committee. You can send them to Ben and he'll forward them on. And then we'll just take a look. And again, you one of your next steps needs to just be, you know, try to define what your what you think your process is going forward. And we'll have a conversation about it and let folks know. All right? That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your effort. I know it's um, uh, you put in a lot of time, so thank you. All right. Um, so let's do. Sorry. Uh, one question about that. Is there yet a timeline for the next steps, or is one of the next steps to figure yeah. out a timeline for next steps? Yeah, it's all to be defined. Okay, great. <laughs> right? Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's do public comments. Um, I've got three on the list here. Uh, I see Teresa Kraft. If you hurry, Terry's still in earshot. Okay. Thank you. That was pretty good. Beacon's housing market and development are in a crisis mode, but it's not the future housing for people who haven't even moved here yet. Sadly, it's the upheaval of what the city has allowed to be destroyed directly on our historic Main Street and the side streets abutting it. So many of these projects recently built currently in construction, as well as the many on the table for reviewing, awaiting for approvals, are either poorly designed, out of character with the neighborhood, or most have seriously, inf seriously infringed on our protected view sheds. And now these past few weeks, you're in discussion pushing more overdeveloped projects throughout every zoning district, on every square inch, in every neighborhood in our city. This rampant building spree is spreading like wildfire, and it's got to be stopped. I saw the perfect hat in the hat parade yesterday. Surely there has to be a way to put some kind of regulations in effect so that this, the city is not continually being designed by the same one architect, represented by the same one lawyer and law firm. The Howland Cultural Center and its nonprofit board Patrons and visitors are witnessing shadows forming from the massive build-out at 5 Tyronda Avenue as they're building up and out a new higher roof line and a massive dormer rooms above and directly in the center's sight line. From now on, all our outdoor concerts and event attendees will be watching people walk back and forth past windows lit up like a Christmas tree. By allowing this light pollution to wash out our beautiful sky view, we are losing touch with our cultural heritage. We are also losing touch with what could inspire future generations. This will have a lasting detrimental monetary impact on our future income, as well as the effect of the quality of life at the center. They have expanded the building, and all it took was a signature on a building permit. Shame on the city of Beacon for letting this pass through a back door and not be being required to go through a full planning board process because the fact is, this is a total rebuild. There was no preservation restoration work done on this historic building built in 1870. This is not only within footsteps of the city's historic overlay district and the Jewel of Beacon, 
but it's also abutting two other historic property lines and sits directly across the street from other historic buildings. There is a lack of control and poor judgment here, and everyone can see it. Heck, it's the talk on the streets. You should be talking about imp implementing a new building in auditorium, but you're probably talking about bringing in the busloads from the city that made Rockland County issue a state of emergency. Truthfully, I don't like complaining any more than you like listening to it, but the serious problem is I don't think you really listen. You all ran on that ticket stating you'd work hard to stop overdevelopment in Beacon, and honestly, you've delivered just the opposite. I wish there was somebody that would be brave enough to run for mayor, and I wish I had the time. Thank you. Um, Ann Weatherby. Hello, Pam Weatherby, 66 Mean Avenue. Um, so I listened to the council meeting the other day, and I'm so disappointed to hear that the Route 52 project will be delayed near my end of town from Memorial Park to the city line. You know, this is a, one of four entryways into our city, and I hope that this project stays top of mind for completion, and hopefully we can get additional county, state, and federal money to have this done in less than five years. Um, there are many pedestrians who use these sidewalks, some handicapped. I mean, numerous times I've watched wheelchairs who travel in the road because the sidewalk is too narrow and too damaged for them to be able to, to be on our sidewalks. Um, you know, at the very least, that section of road needs to be milled and paved since the road was ripped up for gas and sewer lines recently. The crosswalk at Mill Street needs to be painted and crosswalk signs installed. Hardly any vehicles acknowledge this crosswalk. I was trying to cross the other day, at least 20 vehicles passed me by while I stood in a crosswalk. This crosswalk is ignored. We have more residents moving in there. We have planning board projects currently there and somebody's going to get hit, and it possibly could be me. There's a telephone pole at the beginning of the one crosswalk. I'm big enough that they probably could maybe see me, but they're not. But if a child or a small person stood on the west side trying to cross to Mill Street, I, I would be afraid that they wouldn't be seen and be hit. I really would love it if we could have the lights on there and somebody pushed a button and lights go on because uh, people coming into the city there are not driving 30 miles an hour. I'm not 100% sure if they acknowledge it's 30 miles an hour. Um, and also, you know, we've had flooding there um, in front of Kemprain and all the time at the Family Dollar Plaza because for years there's clogged drains. One is I've just right next to the sidewalk. I watched it the other day totally overflowing onto the sidewalk and into the street. Luckily, it's not freezing, which it typically does in the cold weather. And I've been doing a lot of walking, and it's icy a lot there. And never mind, you know, it's also in the roads. Um, also, if these sidewalks aren't going to be done, can they inspect the sidewalks and the areas around it um, of what could be repaired, as some are just gravel? Um, some are very narrow, like 18 inches, and um, 15 seconds. I watched a, a stroller go through it, and they were side to side. They couldn't even get through. But that's typically where the handicap, uh, where the wheelchairs are in the road. So, I strongly recommend that we we really try to to not give up on this area. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of growth there in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, um, Clark Gepman. Good evening, Clark Kevin, 2 Wilson Street. So uh, the president the other day in his first news conference after announcing his uh, uh, intention to participate in the Democratic primary, in the 50th second, he talked about trains going to Syracuse. Not that it hasn't been going on for 100 years, but his point was that the Baltimore crossing at 100 miles an hour was something that appeared to be something that might be of interest. Uh, to doing in New York. And, um, you know, our relationship, my relationship with, uh, with the city of Beacon, the region, as well as the state, 
powers and my experience in Brooklyn and throughout New York City has has educated me that there's a serious problem in America that finds its roots in New York and that's the Federal Reserve System and the effective buyout of New York State politics since 1977 in the judicial context for the appointment rather than election of our Supreme Court judges at the Court of Appeals. So setting all that aside, the only thing that would make me happy is if President Biden, when he comes here two days from now, is if the council would tell the president, Mr. President, we need a crossing to Stewart Airport and we need high-speed rail. And we need to clear the west side yard so that we have more than one train line. And we need it so we can promote housing in Dutchess County, which is among the most fertile places closest to New York City in New York State with a history of rail lines that litters the pastures of this county, unlike any other location. And if we want to discuss the idea of humanitarian assistance, then we do it without, then we do it with a plan, rather. We are now passing the 20th year of Microsoft Access. There is no one more familiar who has ever stepped in this room than I with the power of data and the suppression of government, almost fascist-like oppression, to create fear for data and intelligence and ultimately truth. And so America today, America today, is on the threshold of either data, they call AI, or fascism. So someone in this council needs to tell the president when he comes in two days from now, the only way he'll have Clark Kedman support in the Democratic seconds. primary is that he solved the problem with train access, high-speed rail for New York State, and so our economy can grow in an economy that with Canada is $40 million, New York State and the Canadian border, that's really 40 million people. Your time has lapsed. And that's our market. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I see anyone else in the public here in person, um, although if anyone does want to speak, now is your time to step up. Um, otherwise, uh, Ben, do you have anyone online? If you're joining us on Zoom and you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raised hand option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're joining us by phone, you can press star nine. And if you're watching on YouTube, you will need to join the Zoom by visiting beaconny.gov. And at this time, we have no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Um, let's do our uh, public comments. Um, we won't start with Christian. We'll start next to Christian, but welcome. Council reports? Yeah, uh, that's what I meant. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I meant reports of the council. Hello, a couple of things, and I think some of my fellow council members might be able to talk about this and give more details, but we have a couple of great events coming up this Saturday in our community. Uh, one is Dia Beacon is celebrating their 20th year in our community, and there's a whole host of activities, including I hear a proclamation maybe given by someone around this table related to it. Um, talk more. And then the other is that the Foundation for Beacon Schools has a film festival their second year, and that's going to be this coming Saturday as well in the afternoon, and you can find out more about it on their website. Um, and then the other only thing I'll mention is I'll have office hours on May 21st. That's the Sunday, not this one, but the one after that from 3 to 5 p.m. And also Paloma Wake, who wasn't able to make it today, will have her office hours this coming Friday and Sunday, because she's so organized that way, um, at the rec center between 4 and 6 p.m. both days. And I'll pass it to you. Thanks. Um, I see the mayor has a proclamation for Mental Health Awareness Month, and in addition to May being Mental Health Awareness Month, it's also Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And there are events across the county and in our region um, that you can check out from your local libraries uh, to um, your local cultural centers, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. And um, I will not be hosting office hours this month or formal office hours this month, but if you would like to schedule a time to meet with me, you could do so on the city website, on the city council page. Uh, there's a link right under my name that says schedule a meeting with justice. Um, and the only other thing I had was Paloma's office hours, which Molly covered. So I will pass it to you, George. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, thank all the people that um, helped organize the uh, hat parade this weekend. It was the first time we brought it back in, I think, the last 12 or 14 years. Um, so it's a great tradition. It was a great turnout um, and a great day. So um, hopefully the tradition will continue. But thanks again for all the effort that went into that. That's it. Yes, um, Foundation for Beacon Schools is holding a film festival and this year, on, on this Saturday, and this year they're going to divide up so that at 2.30 you get to see the elementary school films, films made by Beacon Elementary School kids, and then at 6.30 for the filmmakers and the funds raised um, support Beacon Schools. There's also um, a date set for Pride celebrations, June 17th. We'll be celebrating Pride, and you can um, find information on that at um, on the Facebook account for um, what is their Facebook account called? Um, the Human Rights Commission. The HRC, but it also I'll get it for you in just a second, um, and. They're also fundraising for Pride. Um, you can buy a t-shirt to help fundraise for Pride at um, bonfire.com backslash QFAM. And we are working, all of us, to find a date for the flag raising ceremony here at City Hall. So stay tuned for that. But the, we're hoping for a flag raising on June 1st or before. And um, Dan, you go and I will. <laughs> okay. Oh, so actually the Facebook is Beacon LGBTQ Liberation for all of the different events that are going on for Pride in June. There are family events and events later at night and there will be a flag raising which will, um, ceremony which will announce as soon as we have it scheduled. And as for my office hours, um, I usually hold them on Wednesdays by appointment, so you can email me at my city account and we'll schedule something. Thanks. All right. Um, so my, my chair has been empty uh, for a few weeks. I'm glad to be back. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for your patience and understanding as I've been kind of slow in responding to emails. I'm just about caught up. Um, but I had to travel and take care of some family matters uh, in the month of April. Um, but I'm glad to be back. I was uh, out this weekend um, at the Compass Arts Showcase at the Yard and the Forestal Spring, uh, Spring Fest on Saturday. It was a really great time. It was nice to be back in my community. Um, and I'm going to try and uh, make it up to everybody as, uh, as much as I can in the coming weeks. So uh, you'll see me walking around town. I'll be uh, walking around and um, just checking in with folks and seeing uh, what's going on in the neighborhood and uh, what issues are important and uh, what we need to work on. Um, I'll also be hosting my office hours again on a, starting uh, it's the third Sundays of every month. So this month it'll be Sunday, May 21st from 10 to 12 at Tracks at 1 East Main. So come on and have a coffee with me and we can talk about issues and qu what your questions are and comments and stuff. And yeah, looking forward to reconnecting with everyone. Okay. Um, yeah, just a couple of things. One, um, I had the opportunity to uh, attend a luncheon uh, of the Le Suramiabla, which is a service organization of African American women based in Beacon. Um, I had an opportunity to see some um, people I've known for a long time and also some new faces. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to go to that. I also just want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about assessments. So every May, assessment letters come out. Uh, Beacon is a um, full value assessment community which means that they try to keep the assessments close to the market value. Um, and so the thing that's in the letter this year, it's a little hard to sort, but um, the letter um, not only shows the dollar amount that you're increased by on the assumption your assessment increased, but it also shows the percentage increase for all residential properties. So I can give you my letter as an example. Uh, I calculated the percentage increase in my assessment on our home and it was up 10 percent. And then I looked at the bottom of the letter and it said that residential properties on average were raised 10 percent. How, how you can interpret that 
is that your assessment went up at the same, at least my assessment went up at the same rate as the average for the city, which means I won't be getting any larger portion of the tax bill, right? It does not mean that your taxes will rise 10%. What will undoubtedly happen as long as the council approves a modest budget increase is that that 10% increase in assessment will be offset largely by a substantial reduction of the tax rate. Right? It won't be 10% if the, if the budget goes up a little bit, but it'll be something close to that, that the rate will come down. Right? Because we do full value assessment, all that means is that the relative equity or fairness of our assessments stays really close to normal. Right? And communities that don't update every year, and there are some that don't, um, I think it's 18 of the 22 communities in the county update annually or something close to that. So we're a county that generally stays up to date. Um, there are other places in New York State that haven't uh, updated their roles since the Civil War. So uh, if you think that's to your benefit, you're, you're wrong on that. What it means is that the numbers are so skewed and messed up that nobody knows exactly whether it's appropriate or not. And people who have the means to, to go to court to get their assessments adjusted win and people who don't tend to lose out. That tends to be seniors, that tends to be people in um, lower, um, uh, in neighborhoods that aren't appreciating at the same rate as other parts of the community. So we went to full value assessing almost 20 years ago now, as did most of the county, and as a result, our, um, the frequency of our suits are almost nil as a result. Now that doesn't mean that your assessments may not be right. On your letter, there'll be a date for assessment, uh, what are called grievances. What I would encourage people to do is if you think your number is off, come and make an appointment and talk to the Board of Assessment Review. One of the things that you can do is that the Dutchess County maintains a site called Parcel Access. What you can do on the Parcel Access site is you can find your parcel and then you can literally highlight the ones in your neighborhood and see what the assessments are for your neighbors. And that should give you a pretty reasonable sense of whether your assessment is in line or is not. Um, so I would just encourage that and just note that if the average rate was 10% for residential assessment increases and yours is less than that, you're actually going to be getting a decrease in your taxes. If yours was more than that, you may be getting an increase. All right, so I just wanted to push that along, okay? Uh, anything from the city administrator? Um? Uh, just another reminder that we're continuing to flush hydrants. So if you see hydrants in your neighborhood uh, being flushed this week and next week, um, or you experience brown, brown water, um, please, it, it's a temporary situation, just run your cold water and that will pass through. Again, this is a yearly um, maintenance that's critical to making sure that sediment is removed from the system and uh, that our fire suppression system is is working. I also just wanted to note that um, last year we did participatory budgeting and decided to um, take the recommendation of several high school students who had come and presented their ideas to the council. The new basketball backboards and rims were installed at South Avenue and the refilling stations are in and are being set, set up at Memorial Park and Green Street in the next two weeks. I think Green Street's already working. Great. According Great. to my kids who have been enjoying it. <laughs> Good. Okay. That's all I have. Um, all right, so the next order of business is a proclamation. I just want to read um, a piece of it. So there's a proclamation declaring May as Mental Health Awareness Month, whereas mental health is essential to the well-being and the vitality of our families, businesses, and communities, and whereas mental health conditions are real and prevalent in our nation with one out of five Americans and one out of five children affected by mental illness, and whereas more people die from suicide in the United States than from traffic accidents, and an estimated 22 veterans die from suicide each day. Whereas the stigma and fear of discrimination keep many who would benefit from mental health services from seeking help. And whereas with effective treatment, those individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full, productive lives. 
and whereas education, compassion, and awareness about mental illness can change negative attitudes and behaviors toward people with mental illness, and whereas each business, school, government agency, law enforcement agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizen share the responsibility to promote mental wellness and support prevention efforts. Now, therefore, the City of Beacon does hereby proclaim the month of May as Mental Health Awareness Month. And as mayor, I also call upon all uh, City of Beacon residents, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools to recommit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental illness, to reducing stigma and discrimination, and to promoting appropriate and accessible services for all individuals. Thank you. Okay, um, we've got a set of resolutions. The first one is an appointment of uh, Jim Eve to the Recreation Committee. Can I get a motion and a second? Motion, second. So I just want to say, uh, Jim Eve uh, has been in the community for, I guess, since the 70s. He predates me by a while, a while so I don't know exactly when, but it's uh, 30 plus years. And he's done a, you know, you can see in the resume, he's got an extensive background in recreation uh, and he wanted to get involved again, so he put in an application. So I just wanted to encourage the council to approve this one. Okay. Any comments, questions? All right, so all in favor of uh, appointing did James we, Eve to the Recreation Committee say aye. Did aye. Make, aye. Did, did we make a motion? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah, we did. Yeah, you did? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Just Molly and Cool. Yeah. Or, 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 ran, ran, ran. ran. Or my bad. Molly and right. Awesome. Uh, and then anyone opposed? Okay. And then the second one is setting a public hearing regarding stop signs and parking restrictions. Uh, can I get a motion and a second? Motion. Second. So that was Justice and Molly. And Ben, you're going to tell us which specific ones? Correct, and I'll pull those up again. Um, and I also have an answer for uh, Molly's question from last time as well. Um, so just to reiterate from last time, um, the proposal from the Traffic Safety Committee was to make uh, the intersection of DeWint and South Walnut into a four-way stop rather than a two-way stop. Um, that, that was um, pretty quickly agreed upon by the committee. Um, so at this point, if uh, you want to move forward with it, it would be to set a public hearing to get uh, the input from community members on uh, whether or not they believe it's a good idea as well. <clears throat> uh, that's the first of the two options. And then the second one was to extend to no parking along East Main a little further along and on the north end of the street, not just the south. Uh, and uh, Molly had asked about fire and emergency vehicle access. I spoke to Chief Ann Voris, um, and while I don't, I couldn't tell from my notes whether or not this was um, discussed by the committee. Um, this was from back in November, so I wasn't completely fresh on it. I did speak to him about it earlier today about the emergency vehicle access on the stretch, and Chief Ann Voris did tell me that um, with parking on either side of the street along this stretch, it does make very difficult access, for, especially for the larger fire department vehicles. But he also said he had heard that water department vehicles also struggled to have access to this stretch when there's parking even on one of the two sides. So I hope that does answer your question. And this is the second of the two proposals. Okay. Um, I have a question maybe for you, Christian. I just noticed in the description of the actual language about if we do approve this, that it sounds like what we do, which makes sense that from we, we go the direction of travel so from on the north side which is going down the hill we say from mountain lane to shea lane and then from going up the hill we say from pocket road to mountain lane i was just wondering why it wasn't both pocket road or both shea lane is that because of where they are i just was it, it, it i stopped on it for a while and couldn't figure it out i'm just curious if there was a reason uh, it was uh based on the traffic committee's recommendation um if the council likes we could amend it because the, the two roads kind of intersect, so I didn't know if it, I just thought, I thought having a consistent wording, the same street might be less confusing, although maybe people who up there, they kind of know the difference, or, or know that it's basically the same intersection. Do you have I a don't think Ren? I'm understanding what you're getting I mean, at. I, I think it might just be because Shea Lane only goes toward the, nor toward the north. 
They both intersect. If you look in the packet at the intersection, they both intersect at East Main. And so it's basically the same thing, I think, unless we're saying on the one side, it, it's like one less spot. So it was just a question I had. I, I spent, I was kind of caught up by, and so I just thought I'd ask. So. I mean, it, it does make sense. We, it, they're, they're used interchangeably here because they intersect at the same point. But what we should be doing is making this consistent with the existing. So the existing is no parking along the south side of East Main between Pocket Road and Mountain Lane. I think we probably want to use Pocket Lane in lieu of Shea Lane mm -hmm. uh, to be consistent. Yeah, and Pocket Road's been around longer, so I think it, it's easier for people and to it, identify. And it just, and it's for cons consistency, then you can say from Pocket um, all, all the way up to, where's it end? All the way up Mountain Lane um, is no parking now. Okay, great. No, it's a good point. All right, so um, I think we can adjust that for the hearing. Uh, any other comments uh, in terms of setting a public hearing? And the date for it would be the public hearing, two weeks? Yep. May 22nd. Yep. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. So the next one is a resolution authorizing the city administrator to execute an agreement with Alpine Tree Service, and that's for tree re removal and pruning. Can I get a motion and a second on that? Motion. Second. So Ren and George. Chris, you want to give us any further information? Um, we talked about this last week. Um, every two years, we put out to bid our tree services. Um, we, we did that again, and um, the low bidder was Alpine Tree Service, which has done a lot of work for us over the years. So uh, the superintendent of street is recommending we go with them again for the two years. And uh, again, the value of this contract is probably around $25,000 a year for two years. And we had four bidders, if it's of interest. Questions, comments? All right, so all in favor of um, authorizing a city administrator to execute an agreement with Alpine Tree Service, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, so the next one, I'm um, looking for a motion and a second to authorize the city administrator to execute an agreement with Clove Excavators for road paving and bituminous concrete. Motion second. So uh, George and Molly, uh, I just like saying bituminous. Chris, you're going to tell us anything else about this? Um, as we mentioned last week, bituminous concrete is just asphalt pavement. This is uh, the contract for the annual milling and paving that we use. We do each year using CHIPS funds, the Consolidated Highway Improvement Program. Uh, we'll be doing that probably in September or October. Uh, we received three bids, and the low bidder was Clove Excavators, which we used last year and which were terrific. Worked out great. And again, this is a two-year contract. The value is probably somewhere in the four to $500,000 range per year. I have a quick question about the first, whereas it says for tree removal and road paving, bituminous concrete. I didn't know if tree <laughs> removal, I was like, does that, are there trees chance. in our roads? I, I assume it's because you're doing three of these in a row and it just got overlooked. So I just wanted to check. <laughs> yeah, I would, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good catch. We'll, we'll strike those, Ben. So we'll assume that we can remove those words without an amendment, if that's all right? Okay. Christian, you're going to live you. with that? I, I, uh, I, I can live with it. All right, good. Um, I have a question. Did Mickey's title change, or are those just interchangeable superintendent of streets uh, versus highway yeah. su superintendent? His technical um, title as superintendent of streets. He goes by many other names, um, <laughs> including uh, DPW, chief, uh, superintendent, um, and highway, highway director. I like um, but he is of superintendent of streets. Got it. He's very super. Is it a civil service title? It I is to say, a civil yeah, that's the civil yeah, service Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. mm. Got it. Okay, so... Uh, then all in favor of authorizing the city administrator to execute the agreement with Clove Excavators, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. The next one um, 
is another one authorizing the city administrator. This one is an agreement with A. Collinson and Son for asphalt milling. And can I get a motion and a second? Motion. Second. Dan and Molly, and you'll tell us what's different about asphalt milling versus bituminous concrete. Yes. So asphalt milling is the preparation before we repave, and it basically is a grinding down of the existing asphalt uh, surface. Uh, by about a half an inch. Um, we again put this out to bid. Um, Colorusa was Colorusa and Sun were the low bidders, um, and again we received three uh, bids. This this work is probably in the neighborhood of fifteen thousand dollars per year, um, and it it goes a, a, the day before we start paving. So this goes pretty quickly, and then they come back and they repave everything. And if anyone's interested, the definition of bituminous is of containing or of the nature of bitumen. <laughs> there we go. Um, and so apparently milling's a lot less expensive than paving, right? Because yes. it doesn't involve the uh, asphalt, the, the, the bitumen. Yes. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, all in favor of authorizing the city administrator to execute the agreement with A. Calaruso and Son, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, so the next one is a resolution urging the state to pass legislation providing for a right to counsel in eviction proceedings. Can I get a motion and a second? Motion. Second. So that's Justice and Molly. Just, uh, Justice, you want to tell us about it? Yeah, um, so right now there's pending state legislation for right to counsel for all, and as um, those who may be following, this council has done pretty much all that we could to help uh, protect and preserve our tenants here in Beacon, but the state has this legis pending legislation that gives the opportunity for anybody facing evictions to have a right to counsel. Um, and it's been passed in other states statewide, and um, we this resolution is just urging the uh, state to move forward, New York State to move forward with this as well. Um, Any comments, questions? I do have one comment. Um, I appreciate all the edits and suggestions that have been made to this resolution. My one comment is that this is listed as Resolution 52, but I think it's Resolution 51. Um, or on the resolution itself, it says number 52, but the next one also is number 52. Yeah, on the agenda it says number 51, but the thing says... We will change that. Okay. Any further comments? Um, I'm curious, you'd mentioned the last meeting, Lee, that you wanted to talk with um, our Assemblyman Jacobson, and I didn't know if you had anything that you heard I, from him. I did not share. get a chance to do that, okay. but I didn't see any um, pressing reason. So. Thank you. Uh, so all in favor of this um, resolution urging the state to pass a right to counsel and eviction proceedings, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. And then the last one was we've got some budget amendments. Um, can we get a motion and a second to approve the budget amendments to the 20, 2023 general fund budget? Motion. So second. That, that was Justice and Molly. And Chris, you're going to tell us what they are? Sure. Um, these are the, f the first one is a transfer of $6,000 from the contingency fund to fire training. This was a result of having, um, we ended up sending two firefighters to the academy this year where we had anticipated only one would be going. Um, and this helps to backfill their training budget so that the other members of the department can do other trainings. Uh, the second budget item is to transfer $9,000 from contingency into the highway budget for purchase of equipment. And this is for the purchase of two pedestrian activated crossing signals um, on Wolcott, where between the Elks Club and Sargent School. Um, and this is something that the Traffic Safety Committee considered for a long time, tried to figure out why, why in this area would this be um, something that we would do, but not put them on every block. Um, and what we decided is because of its proximity to the school, the, the volume of the road and the speed of the road, that this was an appropriate place. So these will look a lot like the ones um, that were installed by River Ridge on Walcott Avenue.
Any comments? Questions? Oh, and one, one question you've asked me previously is um, to track our contingency, and we, we continue to have 165,000 in contingency after this, ex this transfer. Great. So we went from 180 to 165. Thank you, Chris. All right, so all in favor of this budget amendment say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, um, approval of the minutes. I'm going to look for a motion and a second to approve the minutes of April 24th. Motion. Second. Ren and Molly. I'm not even joking and I'm getting laughs. <laughs> Any comments, questions, additions, changes? All right, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Anyone opposed? So this is the second opportunity for public comment. If you didn't make a comment at the first opportunity, you have the opportunity to do so now. Anyone in the audience like to make a comment? This is your chance. Ben, you got anyone out in the uh, ether? No hands raised on Zoom. I will, unless there's something else, entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Dan and Molly, all in favor? Aye. 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 Everyone, thank you and have a good night. Recordings. <laughs>